Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to IPAs and Managed Care, What Nursing Homes Need to Know for 2020. I'm Deborah Silverman, and I'm here with Amanda Ramirez, and we're going to be walking you through today's program. Just a little bit about today's agenda. First, I'll give a public service announcement about, about our firm. We'll talk a little bit about why an IPA and forming different types of IPAs, joining an IPA, um, building your own IPA, and then I'm going to turn our presentation over to Amanda, who will discuss um, what's new in the law that's going to be impacting nursing homes um, in 2020. We have time for questions and answers at the end, but if you have questions along the way, you can certainly type them to us. They are all anonymous, and we certainly don't mind an answering questions as we go, provided I see it. This is a new technology for me, so for those of you who are uh, used to this, if we have a glitch along the way, forgive us. Um, it's pretty exciting. It looks, it looks very clear on our end. I hope it's clear on yours. So with that, about Garfunkel Wild, we were founded over 40 years ago. Um, for the specific purpose of dealing with healthcare clients. We have grown and grown. We're now in four offices. We have over 85 attorneys, and we pretty much do everything and anything that impacts a healthcare provider, including um, what you see here, day-to-day um, -day operations, litigation. The only thing we really don't do is anything dealing with unions. We don't do that type of labor, although we do do employment law and we don't do any malpractice. So this webinar is going to be New York focused, uh, but the concepts of, of network formation, which is actually what an IPA is, will apply to all other markets as well, including our Connecticut and New Jersey. It's just sometimes there are different regulatory requirements and structures, but the overarching considerations about what networks can and can't do under the federal antitrust laws applies across, across the country. So in New York, you have an independent practice association, which is a creature of statute. Um, the slide gives the definition of what Department of Health defines as an IPA, and it's essentially a an, an network that comes together to contract on behalf of its participating providers. And its purpose is to, co to contract with one or more managed care organizations that are licensed under the New York State Public Health Law. So in the nursing home environment, that's all your Medicaid managed care plans, your managed long-term care plans. They all come under the rubric of an independent practice association. Um, IPAs can be comprised of multi-specialties. They can be comprised of physicians and hospitals, post-acute care providers, nursing homes. They can be a full spectrum of providers, or they could be single specialty, or in the case of nursing homes, you can join together with other types of post-acute care providers, like physical therapists, licensed home care services agencies, CHAS, et cetera, to provide a full panoply of services in the post-acute environment. So why should nursing homes even be thinking about becoming involved with an IPA? Well, for one, you're better positioned to handle the world of managed care contracting. There are strengths in numbers, especially when it comes to value-based payment arrangements, which obviously has been being pushed on, on nursing homes um, by the state of New York. It also forces the nursing home to invest in improving your data, increasing the investment in your own technology so that you're better able to share data and actually clinically integrate in, in with, it, with the other members of the IPA, and I'll talk about that a, a little later. It's hard to go it alone in the world of value-based payments, and as a provider, when you can join with other, other um, nursing homes and other types of providers, you have the ability to face payers with a somewhat stronger bargaining position, provided you cross the T's and dot the I's that we'll talk about a little bit further on. You, what you really want to show as a nursing home, and it's easier to show collectively, is that a good nursing home helps keep patients out of hospitals. And if you keep patients out of hospitals, you are of value to the managed care company. You're of value to other IPAs who could contract 
theoretically with an IP that is comprised of nursing home providers, and that's really your value proposition. So let's talk a little bit about forming an IPA. An IPA requires three regulatory approvals in the state of New York from the Department of Health, Department of Financial Services, and State Education Department. And believe it or not, the hardest thing about forming an IPA is to get approval for your name. Um, getting a name that passes muster with the State Education Department has become somewhat of a challenge recently. And I, I, there's no really rhyme or reason for it except for some quirkiness that's in the department right now. But this is a true story. I once had to cajole the State Education Department to allow a group of gastroenterologists to use the term gastroenterology in the name of their IPA. So it was kind of, you know, a little bit of head scratching on that one, but we got it through. Also, when you're picking a name of an IPA, an IPA must have the letters IPA in its name or the words Independent Practice Association. And that's important because when you're looking at contracts, I recently was asked to look at a contract for a client and they said, oh, it's an IPA contract but it wasn't with an IPA. And it was very easy for me to spot that inconsistency because the name of the vendor um, was, it, was an ink and it did not have the letters IPA or Independent Practice Association in its name. It turned out the vendor didn't even know which of its entities it had formed an IPA, but it didn't even know how it should be contracting on behalf of that IPA. So. The other things about the, the approval process it can take time. Um, we usually, you get the approval from Department of Health and Department of Financial Services relatively quickly, often within a month, and yet again, state ed, they're uh, undermanned, takes a while to get the approval out of them, but we're gently persistent and we tend to get these things done within about 60 to 90 days. Um, the type of legal structure that an IPA can be is whatever, essentially, the, the corporate structure you want. We often do them as limited liability companies. They're very flexible in that an operating agreement is the governing document for a limited liability company. And they can be modified with, with relative ease. If you're a corporation, your governing document is bylaws, and bylaws take a little more effort when you want to make amendments to them. IPAs can be owned by Entities, they, you can set up a parent organization, and they can also be owned by individuals. Like I said, it, it's not a hard process to establish an IPA. Um, when an IPA is formed, its contracts with managed care organizations must be approved by the Department of Health. And Department of Health has also set aside that if an IPA is also going to be doing um, claims payment or utilization management, that contract has to be separate from the contract that's delivering the network of services. And those are called management agreements, and they too have to be approved by the Department of Health. So on to the types of IPA models out there. They typically fall into three buckets, and buckets one and two sometimes are um, in a single IPA. There are those that are clinically integrated, financially integrated, and then there's the old legacy messenger model. Um, you should bear in mind that just joining an IPA in and of itself does not give a nursing home or any other type of IPA participant the ability to do collectively negotiate. That seems to be the one piece of misinformation out there where a client will say, hey, I joined an IPA. That means we can all come together and collectively negotiate. No, it doesn't mean that. Uh, federal and state antitrust laws prohibit competitors from collectively negotiating subject to some exceptions. And that's why you have clinical integration and financial in integration. But just joining an IPA that comes under a messenger model does not allow you to say, well, we're all together now and we can now you know, make sure that we get higher rates. Absolutely not. An IPA needs to be structured properly. What we're seeing most often in, in today's environment are clinically integrated IPAs. And clinical integration, um, the slide in front of you has the definition that was first put forward back in the 90s, 1996 actually, by the Federal Trade Commission. And it is an active and ongoing program to evaluate and modify the clinical practice patterns of 
participants so as to create a high degree of interdependence and collaboration among the participants to control costs and ensure quality. You see the quote is actually based on physicians, but this concept of clinical integration applies across the board, not just to physicians. It would apply to nursing homes, hospitals, um, home care agencies, whomever would be in a, a network, um, participating in a network or participating in an IPA. Clinical integration, it, it actually refers to the policies and programs that the IPA has developed that essentially takes unrelated providers to come together and to be able to negotiate collectively. The issue here is the need to negotiate collectively has to be what is called an antitrust parlance, an ancillary to the coming together. The idea of coming together is that you're, you're coming together because you're going to deliver a better product. It, you're going to be higher quality, more cost effective, and you're going to make sure that the product that you deliver, in order to do that, you need to come to the plan as a whole and say, look, if you, if you negotiate with the IPA as a whole, we are going to be able to deliver these, um, these types of services, and this is why we need enhanced rates, or we're able to come together and take on some risk. And um, it's essentially the triple aim, really, what you're seeing here at the end of the day. I mean, if everyone recalls um, prior to the Affordable Care Act, it was all about we need to revamp our healthcare delivery models to deliver better care to the individual, better health for the population, and controlling the cost of care because it was on an ever increasing uh, spike. So this is this is what has led to these clinically integrated networks, and they are proliferating. What are the factors of success to be a clinically integrated IPA? It takes a strong clinical and administrative leadership. It needs an adequate provider network. You need your IT integration, which is basically interoperability. You don't necessarily have to have the same IT infrastructure, but the members of the network need to be able to communicate to one another through IT. There's always care management, your performance objectives, um, you need sufficient capital, you need to be able to monitor what's going on, see the patterns, and then correct if you see trends that are not appropriate to your goals. Um, in a nursing home situation, you're going to be monitoring readmissions. That's probably the biggest factor that you'd be looking at, or admissions and readmissions. Keeping, you want to keep the residents at the nursing home. And if you're seeing a member of the nurse of, of one of your nursing homes has a higher trend, and you're going to kind of go into that nursing home as the IPA and say, okay, what's going on here? Why do we have so many members of this um, patient, sorry, residents of this nursing home? ending up in the ER. So the IPA could do some corrective action. At the end of the day, the IPA could say, you know what, you're not, you know, you have too many readmissions per hundred and you're no longer eligible to stay in our IPA. Being a clinically integrated IPA is not easy and it doesn't happen overnight. It is a process. It's an ongoing process that can take years till before you are actually able to face plans negotiate collectively if if what you're doing is real and you're really putting in policies and procedures. Typically, I think the fastest I've seen an, an IPA clinically integrate and face plans is 18 months. Financial integration is really more not so much what the IPA is, but how the IPA contracts, right? There you can be um, Financially integrated, taking on full risk, you could take on partial risk, but the idea is it, that the type of risk that you take is going to be in the contract between the IPA and the plan. Um, the amount of risk you can take is negotiable. Nobody says you have to take risk for every service that, you, that you're obligated to provide. You can have parameters in place in terms of risk corridors. You can do contracts that are upside only. Um, and having a, that's a not quite financial integration, but if, if the upside is at least 25%, uh, you would pass muster with antitrust guidelines and being able to negotiate collectively. Um, 
just as an aside, if you have management services that the IP is doing in a, se in a separate contract or through a separate uh, management service organization, that entity cannot take risk. The risk can be taken only by the IPA. Here we're going into a little bit more detail about what a, you know, what a full risk contract looks at. You look at the total cost of care for a nursing home. The best analogy is to the ISNIP contracts, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, in an ISNIP contract, which is a Medicare Advantage plan, the nursing home receives a capitation payment for all services that Medicare member may need, either that would be reimbursable under Medicare Part A, Part B, or Part D, and hospital, physician, and, and drug services. And again, we talked about keeping residents out of the hospital makes that contract more profitable for the nursing home. Again, ISNIP, you can enter into a nice a NICENIP nice individually as a nursing home, but if you were part of a, a nursing home IPA, the IPA itself could enter into a contract with an ISNIP plan as well. Um, ISNIPs also tend to have nurse practitioners on site who manage the care of the members of the ISNIP. Partial risk essentially is you can take partial risk by only putting in certain types of services. You don't want to be responsible for Part D services or Part B services, but you'll be responsible only for Part A services if it was a Medicare plan. Commercial plans, you can itemize what services are being included, or you can take, you can be responsible for payment for all services based on a targeted budget for healthcare, but you could have carved out uh, risk quarters. In other words, you'll be responsible for only 20% above the budget, or you'll be responsible for only 10% above the budget. Bottom line is you can also just say, you know what, we're not ready to take on partial risk, but maybe we would do some shared savings, which is upside only. So you create that budget for total cost of care for the residents in your nursing home who participate in that plan. And then if, the, if you beat the budget, you're able to share in that savings. You uh, usually, probably all the time, if you're only going to do upside only, the amount of money you can share in, in, in upside is less than what you would share if you were willing to be at risk on the downside. Plans want to push providers into uh, risk arrangements, which means you are going to have risk on the downside. Interestingly enough, um, I've been speaking to a gentleman who would love to meet with all of you, he wants to sell insurance products that actually insure against downside risk. So that's a very interesting concept. So if you could, you know, kind of hedge your bet by buying some insurance that would, would cover the risk of loss, it may actually make risk agreements more palatable. A little bit about the messenger model. The messenger model really came into vogue in the 90s and that what it was used for was to bring out-of-network providers in network. Um, it, it's really a conduit of information and I know those are sometimes the ones that feel the best, right? Well, I'm just going to join this IPA, I maintain the ability to make decisions about what, what plans I want to join, but you have to remember this IPA, that's a messenger model, cannot negotiate rates. They essentially are sending offers out to the plan and saying, look, we have a, a constituency of X number of nursing homes. We cover all five boroughs of Manhattan. And we know that if you offer, if you plan offer 100% of Medicare, you will have 100% participation. If you offer 90% of Medicare, you will only have 90% participation. But they can't, the IPA cannot go say to the plan, you know, uh, my network will only participate if you pay us 105% of Medicare. That they can't do. All they're really doing is sending offers and counter offers or offers and acceptances back and forth between the plans and, and uh, the IPA members. There is no bargaining power in a messenger model IPA. And there is no wink, wink, nod, nod. There is no ability for an IPA to, to 
threatened that you won't get all my membership. It really is something that um, must be obeyed. It is strictly enforced by the Federal Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. There are a, a host of IPAs that have uh, come under scrutiny, have had to disband or reform because they violated um, or they threatened a plan that they would not negotiate on behalf of their members, that they you know, would only negotiate collectively on behalf of the members and there was no financial integration or clinical integration. So as you can tell, I'm not a big fan of messenger models at this stage of the game. Our environment is pretty well uh, saturated in terms of in-network participation and there are a lot of clinically integrated and other types of IPAs out there. So let's talk a little bit about um, forming an IPA versus joining an existing IPA. And this is the classic, should I buy it or build it? Um, the pros with forming an IPA is that you create it in the image that, that you want, right? You basically, you, you, you partner with similarly situated nursing homes or with other types of providers where you have a common culture. You can decide which entities you want to contract with. And you can expand, you get to choose what IT you know, systems you're using, um, management, care management, things that you want to pilot, and it's definitely, you're, you have control. The cons, the biggest one is cost, right? You, you don't know what the cost will be in total. You've got to invest your capital. Um, you may have less negotiating strength than an, a pre-existing IP that's out there that already has a reputation within the industry. And getting providers to buy in and saying, okay, yeah, we want to form this new IPA without a proven track record could be difficult. Often, um, with, for example, with ACOs, I know it has taken some of the ACOs under the, under the Medicare uh, shared savings program years to become profitable. But if you join one of those now, hey, they're doing a really good job and you have a better chance of being profitable if there's a, a pre-existing history. So what do you look for in joining an IPA? You want to see an organizational structure that's solid. You'd want to see transparency. You want to make sure that you, you speak to other providers who are already in. What do they think about the organization? Even ask the plans. Oh, you know, you have a contract with Elder Plan. You know, uh, reach out to Elder Plan. Is this IPA doing what it's supposed to do? Are they a good provider for uh, a good network for me to join? One other thing in the world of nursing homes that's important to talk about is the the difference between when we talk about cultures. It usually breaks down between not for profit and for profit nursing homes. There is no law that says a not-for-profit cannot join an IPA with that is comprised of for-profit. Um, but because of the cultural differences, they tend to be separate. But again, any requirement that a, that a particular type of I, IPA only service not-for-profits versus for-profits is found in the, in the organizational documents of that particular IPA. There is no legal mandate that they not mix, and they could. They absolutely could if, if there were willing parties. A um, couple more pros and cons about joining an IPA. You don't have to start from scratch. There's probably less financial investment. You may not be able to take out as much either, though, because sometimes the owners of the original IPA usually reserve some monies in a shared savings arrangement or in a risk arrangement that they're going to be able to pull out more money from the IPA as opposed to downstreaming it all to the participating providers. There could be differences in management structure. You could have a culture that's not quite aligned. But again, you could have greater possibility on the pro side for getting financial return if you join a pre-existing IPA. So that's it for my piece of the presentation at this point. Um, are there any questions that, that any one of you have? I, mean, I, I have one. Let me just, just read it. Um, the the uh, attendee writes, we don't have the wherewithal to invest in joining an IPA. Can we still participate in value-based payment arrangements? Yes, you absolutely can still participate in value-based payment arrangements. Um, 
the question will be, are the plans willing to participate with you? But there's no prohibition. You're just better off being part of the network. Okay, so if you have any other questions, send them on. We'll get them at the end of the presentation. And now I'm going to turn it over to Amanda, who's going to talk about what's happening in the law that's affecting nursing homes in 2020. Great. Thanks a lot, Deb. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just going to go over some updates uh, in managed care, specifically affecting uh, nursing homes and managed long-term care generally. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the 1115 waiver changes, uh, those two updates involving managed long-term care, um, an update to the law around uh, physician privilege disclosures, um, an update to the CMS emergency preparedness rule, um, and then also some Medicaid payment updates. Um, so as you may or may not know, um, in December, CMS approved uh, two modifications to the 1115 waiver uh, related to long-term care. And those two, uh, the first was carving out a long-term nursing home care, so anything beyond three months uh, from being covered under managed long-term care. And then um, a change to the plan selection and lock-in period for uh, managed long-term care plans. Uh, so the first about um, the nursing home managed long-term care carve-out. Um, so the nursing home benefit under partially capitated managed long-term care plans um, is now limited to three months for residents who are designated as long stay residents. Uh, the term of art is um, long-term nursing home stays. Um, but so what this really does is, uh, so any member who's currently in a nursing home uh, who's been designated as a long stay resident, uh, if they remain in that nursing home beyond three months, uh, they're involuntarily disenrolled from their current managed long-term care plan uh, and automatically enrolled into uh, Medicaid fee-for-service. Uh, so members who are in involuntarily disenrolled uh, have the same appeal rights, uh, which is the fair hearing process uh, through the Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance um, as other members. So this is the same as if a member was involuntarily disenrolled for any other reason, uh, they can still appeal that. Um, and in the 1115 waiver letter, uh, CMS stated that if a member successfully appeals this determination, uh, they don't have to to undergo um, getting kind of recertified to be eligible for MLTC, uh, they'll be automatically re-enrolled in their previous plan. Um, and this also affects um, new enrollment into managed long-term care plans. So um, any dual eligible members who are 21 years or older um, and are designated as this long-term nursing home stay um, are excluded from joining uh, managed long-term care plans. In this uh, is effective February 1st. Uh, so currently, uh, none of these members could join a managed long-term care plan. Uh, so in terms of the timeline and notices, um, in mid-January, uh, the Department of Health uh, sent out an informational notice of this change to all managed long-term care plan members, whether or not they qualified as this long-term stay. Um, and then, so members who do qualify as this long-term stay, the three months or more, um, outside of New York City, uh, the notice will be mailed uh, February 13th, and the disenrollment will be effective March 1st. Uh, and then inside uh, New York City, the notice will be mailed March 16th and will be effective uh, for April 1st. And then the second change under the 1115 waiver uh, was to align managed long-term care enrollment period with that of uh, kind of traditional Medicaid managed care. Uh, so this means that once a member selects a managed long-term care plan, uh, they're essentially locked in for 12 months from the effective date of their enrollment. Uh, for the first 90 days of that enrollment, um, the member can change managed long-term care plans um, without cause, but after the first 90 days, um, the transfer to a different plan can only occur for a good cause. Uh, and some of these good causes include if the member moves away from the service area of a managed long-term care plan, um, if the plan's unable to provide the member with appropriate or accessible services and supports that they may need, 
uh, due to poor quality of care, uh, lack of access to experienced providers within that planned service area, um, and then a determination that the enrollment was non-consensual, so any fraudulent activity in the initial enrollment. Um, however, this doesn't include if a nursing home uh, leaves the managed long-term care plans network. Uh, that's not a grounds for good cause to change plans. That's so just something to be aware of. And then the next thing I wanted to highlight um, was there was an amendment to public health law um, that now requires nursing homes and other long-term care facilities uh, to provide detailed information about physician privileges at their facility uh, to potential residents. Um, so uh, nursing homes and long-term care facilities can accept these residents until they provided them with a description. Um, and in the actual bill, uh, the example was given in the nursing home residency agreement, um, but the information about physician privileges has to be made public. Um, so any potential resident going to, into a nursing home or a long-term care facility uh, needs to be aware of the physician privileges uh, prior to this. And uh, this policy at the nursing home to provide this information needs to be in place um, by February 18th, so that's something that's coming up. And then um, the next update I wanted to talk about was um, CMS uh, released revised guidelines uh, to their emergency preparedness rule in, um, on September 30th, 2019. Uh, these guidelines became effective on November 29th, 2019. Um, and I'm sure most of the people on today's webinar are well versed in the emergency preparedness role, but just, just in case, um, the emergency preparedness role was originally implemented uh, in November of 2017, um, and any provider or facility uh, has to comply with these rules in order to participate in Medicare, and also a lot of accreditation um, organizations use kind of these similar or more stringent standards. Um, and the emergency preparedness rule requires a facility or provider to have things such as an emergency plan, uh, policies and procedures based on an emergency plan and a risk assessment conducted by the facility or the provider, uh, training and testing of the emergency plan, um, and then includes things like temperature controls, emergency power system, and things like that. Uh, so these are, there's 17 provider and facility types that fall under the rule. Um, I think most of our audience today probably falls under long-term care facilities, but I did want to highlight that it's applicable to PACE, uh, home health agencies, hospices, uh, and several other types of facilities and providers. Uh, so like I discussed, uh, in effective in November, uh, there's changes to the emergency preparedness rule. Um, one that's applicable to all provider types is previously there was a requirement that um, a facility or a provider needed to document their efforts to work with local, state, federal, tribal, if applicable, authorities in their emergency planning. And uh, so CMS took away this requirement to have to show the documentation, um, but they still encourage facilities to work with local authorities. It's just no longer something that you would have to show. Um, so then the next two changes actually apply to all provider types except for long-term care. Um, so for all provider types except for long-term care, uh, the requirement was lessened so that so every other provider type only needs to review their emergency plan once every two years, um, but long-term care providers still need to annually review their emergency plan. Um, and the second change that's applicable to everyone but long-term care uh, is that train, staff trainings need to be conducted every other year, uh, but for long-term care, uh, the providers need to train their staff every year. Uh, and the rationale CMS used kind of for still keeping these uh, requirements for long-term care facilities was due to the unique patient population and safety needs uh, that may arise in an emergency. Uh, so these two requirements are, the, they remain the same as the original rule. Um, so if you're in compliance with that, uh, the good news is you don't need to change anything uh, for those two. 
Um, and then the final change that they made is uh, they differentiated this between outpatient and inpatient providers. Uh, so outpatient providers, and these are ASCs, PAYS, home health agencies, et cetera, um, only need to conduct one exercise testing their emergency plan per year, um, but the test has to be a full-scale community-based exercise. Um, and then for inpatient providers, which is long-term care facilities, hospitals, et cetera, um, they still need to conduct two tests, um, but only one of them needs to be a full-scale community-based exercise. And then the second uh, test of the emergency plan is up to the facility. So it can be a drill, a tabletop exercise, so on and so forth. So in terms of complying with the emergency preparedness rule, uh, CMS surveyors um, will use two different methods uh, to determine compliance. Uh, they may come in and interview individual staff members, asking them about pieces of an organization's emergency plan. Or the second will be asking to actually see documentation. So this could be proof that the plan is revised annually or a sign-in sheet from a new staff training, something like that. Um, and in terms of non-compliance, so non-compliance is considered a condition level deficiency. Um, so usually if for some reason a CMS surveyor would come in and find um, that the facility isn't meeting the rule, um, they would usually have a 60-day remediation program. But if, um, this, if any uh, deficiencies aren't corrected, it could result in termination from Medicare. So it's important to make sure um, that your facility is in compliance um, Um, and then my final update um, is Medicaid payment updates. Um, by the end of March 2020, um, at the latest, uh, the Department of Health is returning non-specialty nursing homes uh, to the two-week payment lag. Um, so this means that these nursing homes will experience two weeks potentially without a Medicaid payment. Um, and this is related to the July 2019 rates. Um, and then also another thing is uh, in December, uh, Governor Cuomo announced that effective on January 1st, uh, 2020, there will be a 1% reduction on most Medicaid payments. Uh, and this reduction will be in effect through March 31st, which is the end of the fiscal year for the state. Um, so this will obviously show in a cut um, in terms of the payment received for services billed through Medicaid. Um, one important thing to note is that the cut doesn't affect programs that are paid entirely out of federal funds. Um, and for example, the biggest group not affected would be services provided uh, through the Office of Mental Health and the Office of Persons with Developmental Disabilities. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Um, so, Amanda, let me just interject for a moment. So, we're getting a lot of uh, concerned calls from clients dealing with the fact that there's this 1% retroactive reduction. And the, and the concern is if you are a provider and you're receiving monies from, let's say, a managed Medicaid plan, that managed Medicaid plan is going to see a 1% reduction from the revenue it receives from from the Department of Health. Now, the question becomes, will that managed care payer pass through that 1% reduction to its providers? Now, under the contract, and, you, and this is going to be interesting to see how this plays out, under your contract, does the plan have the right to make a retroactive rate reduction in what you've negotiated based on the fact that the government has cut their funds by 1%? So I, I haven't seen anything yet in writing about this. I can tell you from what happened with the 2% sequestration reduction, which was a reduction that the Medicare program uh, enacted due to an act of Congress. And the guidance that CMS gave out, it said to, it, to the Medicare Advantage plan, if your contract with the provider said you could pass the reductions, you can. But if your contract is silent, you cannot just take 2% away. 
That being said, plans did it anyway. So um, take a look at your contracts. See if the plans have the right to make this 1% reduction. They may. I have seen contract language that expressly states that if the government reduces what we pay, we can reduce what we pay you. There's also the ability for the in some of these contracts for the plans to send out unilateral amendments, which need to be prospective. But as providers in this space, um, the nursing home should really pay attention and see what's happening with this 1% reduction on their rates under their managed care contracts. Um, it, the plans, like I said, they did it anyway. And then the 2% the reduction under, the, under sequestration, based on the total amount of funds that different providers were receiving from the Medicare Advantage plans, it didn't become financial, for some it wasn't financially, um, didn't make financial sense to actually challenge it. For others, it made tremendous sense and it ended up being quite a fight. Um, we had litigation on it for some clients, so I'm expecting, this is only a three month window for now, right? It's Jan January, February, and March. We don't know what Cuomo is going to do though going forward. And I can only just, you know, again, caution you, take a look at your contracts see what the plans can do, what they can't do, and then what they're going to do. Um, I would expect you're going to see 1% rate reductions. So that is probably the hottest topic that this industry has been talking about dealing with uh, the governor's budget. So do we have any questions, any more questions dealing with, because this is all we had on, on our uh, agenda today. I think we'll let you go early. So thank you very much for joining us. And feel free to call us with any questions, email us that you have if, if something comes to you later on. Um, and manage to show that there's our contact information. And we wish you all a great day. Thanks again. Bye.